few remarks to uh, put the day into a setting for you here. My name is Pat Sheehan. I'm the chairman of the board of the Connecticut Public Affairs Network, which is responsible for the educational programming here at the old State House, in addition to the functioning of the Connecticut Network CTN service at the State Capitol. Uh, we welcome you to this special place where our freedoms are celebrated every day. The debate in our country and in our state right now actually has to do with the scope of government, the size of government, the power of government in relation to the individual rights and liberties of the citizens of the state. And that is something that we're going to be remarking on today. It was on this meeting house site back in 1638 that the Reverend Thomas Hooker first unveiled the fundamental orders which became, as you well know, the first written structure of government for the Connecticut colonies. It was a declaration of individual rights that was built on the principles of the Mayflower Compact. It brought together what was called a combination of three settlements, Hartford, Windsor, and Wethersfield. And it became the basis of what was the Royal Charter at a later date, later in the century, and that royal charter was actually accepted with the individual freedoms that were outlined by the king at the time. And that, of course, was King Charles II. On his passing, his predecessor, his successor, rather, uh, King James, King James II, tried to recall the charter that Connecticut had built. And that was what led to us being known as the Charter Oak State as the citizens hid the charter away from the British in an oak tree not far from this site. And so here we are in the halls where freedom has been celebrated ever since here in the Connecticut colonies. It's fitting today that we welcome the founding document of American independence from the Crown, a document that outlined a list of grievances that the governed had with the governors an oppressive government was to be shed by the citizens of Connecticut and bring us to the freedoms that we celebrate still today. I'd like to introduce for you right now the director of the Old State House, Sally Whipple. Thank you, I'd like to welcome everybody today to Connecticut's Old State House and to express our thanks to the Lear Family Foundation for bringing the Declaration of Independence to this building. This building is um, really a hub of history and, and civics in the state of Connecticut. It's a place where people have come for hundreds of years to hear news, to argue, to debate, to agree upon things, and to exercise their rights as citizens. It, that makes us a fitting place to have the Declaration of Independence today. And partnering with the Lear Family Foundation on this is particularly um, providential for us because our mission is to inspire people to civic action, to use history to teach people about people from the past who made a difference by exercising their civic rights. And the Lear Family Foundation is working very hard to bring civics to people, to bring people into civics, and to promote voting throughout the country. So we are very pleased and honored to have the declaration here and to partner with the foundation. I would like to now introduce Brent Miller, who is the Director of Special Programs for the Lear Family Foundation and who has been working this morning with school groups and the public to tell them about the Declaration, its story, and really the story of America. So please um, join me in welcoming Brent Miller. Thank you. Uh, we started the last leg of this tour about three weeks ago at, at Pearl Harbor uh, in Honolulu, and we've been working our way east ever since. We had uh, 43 states before we started with only seven to go. And when we found out in Connecticut that we were coming to Hartford and Norman could not be here, as many of you may or may not know, he was born in New Haven and grew up in Hartford, uh, he wanted to send some words. So I asked him to write a letter and I'm, I'm going to read that to you now. To the good people of Hartford, I'm so sorry my wife and I couldn't join you today for this lovely reception honoring the Declaration of Independence visit to the old State House. I was born in New Haven, as you may know, and raised largely in Hartford. I graduated from Weaver High School in the class of 1940. 
I still have family in this area, some of who are likely in attendance today. How I would love to be able to call my mother to tell her that I was bringing an original copy of the Declaration of Independence to Hartford and that it would be greeted by the Governor, the Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court, and other state officials. I'm sure that she would react as she did long ago when I called to tell her that I was being inducted into the Television Academy Hall of Fame along with Lucille Ball, Milton Berle, Edward R. Murrow. And she said, listen, if that's what they need to do, who am I to say? I think of this copy of the Declaration of Independence as our nation's birth certificate because it was printed on the night of July 4th, 1776, and sent on horseback around the 13 colonies to be read aloud in the town squares. This copy is one of 25 known to exist in the world and the only one in private hands. Our goal was to tour it to cities large and small across the 50 states. Connecticut is our 48th state, and we'll be visiting the remaining two states in the next week. This tour, which started at the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, Utah, also included visits to the Super Bowl, the Daytona 500, and has toured multiple cities in most states. Watching families with their children and teachers with their entire classrooms standing in line for as long as 90 minutes to spend a few precious moments viewing their country's birth certificate has always brought tears to my eyes. Because they recognize that this document is their guarantee of the Founding Fathers' promise of liberty, opportunity, and equal justice for all. Thanks for coming and enjoy. Thank you, Brent. Here in Connecticut, there is no one who is more committed to civics education and the engagement of the public in public affairs than our next speaker, our Secretary of the State, Denise Merrill. Thank you, Patrick, and I'm honored to be here today. Uh, Connecticut has an incredibly rich history, and this adds its luster to our history. I can't actually believe I'm here today uh, with one of our founding documents that has perhaps the most famous sentence ever written in American government, one we're still arguing about, that one about, you know, all men being created equal and so forth, and has become a rallying cry throughout the world right now. What more poignant moment to be looking at our Declaration of Independence that has been the inspiration throughout the world for the people that just want what we have. It's embodied in this document. It's a living, breathing document. It keeps changing, and I, I hope we can use it to continue to educate the public, particularly the next generation, about their role in preserving not only this document, but the sentiments that it contains. So uh, I, I think it's great that we're here today in this wonderful, historic building where these things have been debated for centuries. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy that Connecticut ho could host this event here in our old state house, and I'm glad to be part of it. Thanks. Thank you, Denise. In just a few moments, we will uh, go downstairs to the courtroom area, and we invite you all to join us down there for a reading of the original language of the document that uh, really sets the stage for our freedoms that we have so enjoyed. As Secretary Merrill has just noted, in this time, in this day, in this age, this document still breathes the life into our country and into her people. It is something for which we are extremely grateful to the courage and the vision of our founders. And although the words continue to be debated in so many quarters around the globe, we all recognize that the fundamentals of freedom remain the same throughout humanity. We are very grateful to the Norman Lear Foundation. Brent, thank you so much for bringing this document to the people of Connecticut today. Please enjoy the rest of the day. We'll have a discussion involving our state historian, our state librarian, and our secretary of the state following a reading downstairs. Thank you all for coming today. A declaration by the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth 
the desperate and easy station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God and system, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impede them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. Laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them they shall see most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together the legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such disillusions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasions from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for the purpose of obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws by establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislature. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to civil power he has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, 
giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing there an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule in these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures, and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burned our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in our attention to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and our correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them, as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Signed by order and in behalf of this Congress, this date, July 4th, 1776.
I want to thank all of you for being here today, and I want to thank all of our readers. You may have recognized a few of them, although I'm imagining that uh, one of the original signers of the Declaration is probably someone that you did not know by face, uh, Sam Huntington. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, you may perhaps have recognized the uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, and you may have recognized some constitutional officers, Denise Merrill, uh, Pat Sheehan. We have a number of uh, people who have come here today, including Carolyn Lumsden from the Hartford Current, the Hartford Current, of course, publishing at the time that the Declaration was being published. I want to thank also the Norman Lear Foundation, which made it possible for all of us to be here today in the company of this amazing, amazing document. And that is because the Norman Lear Foundation owns the document. And in fact, as some of you may know, Norman Lear hails from Hartford. Uh, we do have someone from the Foundation here today who'd like to read you a letter. Uh, Brent, we'd love to hear it. Part of this I'll read uh, from paper, and part that did not print out I'll read from my cell phone. <laughs> so, to the good people of Hartford, I'm so sorry my wife and I couldn't join you today for this lovely reception honoring the Declaration of Independence's visit to the old State House. I was born in New Haven, as you may know, and raised largely in Hartford. I graduated from Weaver High in the class of 1940. I still have family in this area, some of who are likely in attendance today, over here. How I would love to be able to call my mother to tell her that I was bringing an original copy of the Declaration of Independence to Hartford, and that it would be greeted by the Governor, the Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court, and other state officials. I'm sure that she would react as she did long ago when I called to tell her that I was being inducted into the Television Hall of Fame, along with Lucille Ball, Milton Berle, and Edward R. Murrow. And she said, listen, if that's what they need to do, who am I to say? <laughs> I think of this copy of the Declaration of Independence as our nation's birth certificate because it was printed on the night of July 4, 1776, and sent on horseback around the 13 colonies to be read aloud in the town squares. This copy is one of 25 known to exist in the world and the only copy in private hands. Our goal was to tour it to cities large and small across the 50 states. Connecticut is our 48th state and we'll be visiting the remaining two states in the next week. This tour, which started at the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, Utah, also included visits to the Super Bowl, the Daytona 500, and has toured multiple cities in most states. Watching families with their children and teachers with their entire classrooms standing in line for as long as 90 minutes to spend a few precious moments viewing their country's birth certificate has always brought tears to my eyes because they recognize that this document is their guarantee of the Founding Fathers' promise of liberty, opportunity, and equal justice for all. With the news we received this week, this couldn't be a more important time to rededicate ourselves personally to finish the work our founders started. They pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. In Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya, we have young men and women again pledging their lives. We are left to pledge our sacred honor to the pursuit of life and liberty for all. And may we do just that. Thank you, Hartford. Norman Lear. I'd like to tell you that uh, this program is being taped by the Connecticut Network CTN, and you'll be able to watch it on CTN and on your computer. It is also being taped by the Norman Lear Foundation for a documentary that they're producing on the road trip uh, for the Declaration of Independence, so you can look for that sometime in the future. I'd also just like to acknowledge someone who is here with us today. I'd like to ask uh, Channing Huntington to stand up, please. Uh, Channing is related to one of Connecticut's signers of the Constitution. Constitution, uh, excuse me, of the Declaration of Independence, Samuel Huntington. Uh, he is also affiliated with the Governor Samuel Huntington Trust in Scotland, Connecticut. And we should tell you that Governor Huntington died in office just before this building opened in 1796, and he was instrumental in getting it built. And we thank you and your family so much.
Well, we're very, very, yes, I guess he would be just a little elderly, but thank you so much for being here. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the Declaration of Independence. Um, to do that today, we thought we'd uh, just take a few minutes to give you a few insights. Joining me now is the state historian, Walt Woodward, who is just here to my immediate left. Seated in the center is the state librarian, Kendall Wiggin, and Denise Merrill is the secretary of the state. Now, probably you figured, well, a historian and a librarian, that makes sense. Why did they invite Denise Merrill, and of course we invited Denise because when Norman Lear sent this, con this uh, copy of the Declaration, excuse me, out to tour the 50 states, his goal was to try to get people engaged in their government and to get people to think about their democracy and to vote. And that, of course, is one of the primary jobs of the Secretary of the State. And I'll let you start today with the fact that this still comes to us after all this time. We're still urging people to be involved in their governments. That's right. And for that reason, I see this as fundamentally an ongoing struggle. It didn't end with the revolution. In fact, uh, in this country, it's been a steady march toward enfranchisement of more and more people. Because, of course, when the government was first formed, uh, only white males who owned property could vote. And so over the several hundred years we've been working at this, we have expanded that vote to more and more people. Why is that so important? Because that's what gives people a stake in the society. And the genius of this country, and actually this document being the inspiration for that, is that we kept adding people in. And we were able to successfully bring people in and have them feel they had a stake. So we expanded the vote to black people. When in the original version of the Constitution, when they said all men were created equal, it didn't quite mean them at that time. That's a debate we continue to have. Then only 90 years ago, women were given the vote. Only 90 years ago. My mother turned 90 this year. She was born the year the women got the right to vote. And then, of course, during the Vietnam War, it was felt that, well, if you turn 18 and you can get drafted and sent off to war, uh, maybe you should be allowed to vote too. So the 18-year-olds got the vote. And in between all those things, we had millions of people from every conceivable country in the world who have come to this country and become voting citizens and felt like they were part of the country. It is the genius of what we're doing. But it doesn't stop there. And we have to renew that every generation. And as most people know, right now, people are not voting in the numbers that they should be. Even in the last presidential election, 2008, where there was quite an inspiration, particularly among young people, to come vote for a new youngish president who had inspired people, Barack Obama. Even then, the number of eligible voters in this country was still about, only about a third of people who were eligible to vote actually voted. I mean, that's an astonishing number. Um, why is that? And that's what has us all continually trying to work at why people are feeling like they don't need to vote. There have been many studies about it. I am going to dedicate my administration in the next four years to trying to figure out what's going on in our society that means that people either, if you ask them, they say, well, my vote doesn't really count. I'm not sure what that means, and of course you can say to people all day that, well, you know, many elections in this country have been won by one or two votes. Yes, your vote does count, frequently. But that's not a good enough answer, is it really, because people are still saying that. And if anything we were taught by this document, it's, you better listen to people, <laughs> because they'll do something else. <laughs> exactly. And, and it was indeed, I think, a far more political document than many of us realize, uh, really listing all of the complaints. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how we got to the point of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, Walt Woodward is going to tell us a little bit about the run-up to the Declaration. Sure. We, we think of the war for independence as being about independence right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the war began a year and three months or three or four months before we declared independence. The idea of actually breaking away from a long-term relationship with the king and declaring yourself capable of self-government, of being free and independent people, was so astonishing that even while they were waging war, 
it took them over a year to get there. The, the, there were a number of factors that finally led to the decision for independence. The Americans had some great military victories right at the beginning of the conflict, the Battle of Lexington, Ticonderoga in May, then the Battle of Bunker Hill. But it wasn't until things got bad, really bad, that they said, okay, we need to make this break. And in the winter of 1775, the Americans kind of flushed with victory, but knowing that Britain with the largest, most powerful army in the world could come the next year and bring that army to fight them, were extremely worried about an attack from Canada. So the Americans launched two armies. They sent them up in October and November up into Canada to take Quebec because they, they thought the French would come side with them. Well, they got to Quebec and their worst enemy winter beat them to it. Mm -hmm. So when they got there, the Americans were defeated soundly. It left uh, Canada and New York, the Hudson River Valley, and possibly the Connecticut River Valley open to attack by a British army. The Americans needed allies. The place where they would naturally turn was to France. Mm -hmm. France didn't want to get involved in a war that might turn out to be a family squabble. So they were very reluctant <laughs> to come side with the Americans and say, oh, you guys patched it up and what happens to our money, our men, our soldiers. So over the six months from January 1776 to July 4th, a number of changes happened. One of the most important was a pamphlet. In January of 1776, Thomas Paine published a document that changed the world. It was called Common Sense. And it put in common language, every single one of us in this room could understand the exact reasons why Americans had a right to and ought to break from the crown. He said, it's, it's ridiculous to turn authority over your government to someone who's 3,000 miles away. It's ridiculous to give that authority to a hereditary monarch. Sure, the one you have now might be good, but his grandson might not be so good. This is a silly way to govern yourself. People were convinced his language had incredible power. And the people of America who had been on the fence about this, this act, actually over that six months became mobilized. In June of 1776, a British army came into New York the largest invasion fleet, seaborne invasion fleet, the world had ever seen. And the Americans knew, if we're going to stand up to this, we have to have our allies. That prompted the actual move in Congress for independence. And if you listen to the reading, there are, there's one phrase that's repeated twice, and it's that we are and of right ought to be free and independent states. That in the 18th century was legal language. And it said, we are declaring ourselves completely separate from the crown of Great Britain. It was an appeal to, uh, to foreign allies to jump in and help us do this thing that had never been done. To really create a world in which all men are created equal, something we're still working out. Thomas Paine in his pamphlet told the Americans, he said, you have the right and the ability to begin the world anew. And here today, we as Americans still, I think, feel we have that right and sometimes that duty. Thank you, Walt. Can many of us think, um, I have to say, including myself, that the Declaration of Independence was signed by all of the signers on July 4th, 1776. Isn't that why we set off the fireworks? Well, it was approved on that date. It wasn't actually signed until over a period of time through August of that year, um, partly because people needed to get back and, and to sign it. What is touring today is called the Dunlap copy. And right after it was approved, um, Dunlap was a printer and was ordered to print copies that would then be traveled around um, the colonies. 
And so that is one of the more famous copies. But you, if you look at it, you won't see signatures. You won't even see a list of who signed it. Um, if you go to Washington and see the copy that's at the National Archives, that has all the signatures and the states um, and John Hancock's very large signature. But this copy has John Hancock's name, but it's printed. Um, later, in January of 1777, the Congress ordered that a copy be printed that included the names of all the men who had signed the Declaration. Because up until then, it wasn't well known. It might have been back in the colony of who uh, from that colony had signed, but nobody really knew who all the signers were. This was still treacherous uh, to be listed. So. By then, Congress felt comfortable enough and needed the public to really understand who had signed this. It wasn't just John Hancock. Um, and so they ordered a printing, and interestingly, they picked a woman printer, uh, Mary Catherine Goddard. And those copies were sent by cover letter from John Hancock, and the copy um, was printed and then included the names of everyone and then signed by John Hancock and sent to each of the colonies. Well, Connecticut is fortunate to have one of the nine remaining copies of that particular document. So it's a unique document in that it actually lists the names. It has John Hancock's very large signature. Um, we also have a letter in the archives that accompanied it um, explaining, uh, from John Hancock, explaining that Congress felt it was important for the citizens of the colonies to understand the magnitude of what had occurred and wanted this recorded in the archives of each of the colonies, later to be the states, um, that it would be there as a permanent record. And it's important that we have these original documents. You can go on the internet today and see lots of scanned copies of lots of different versions of the Constitution. You can go to a gift shop in Washington and get a parchment kind of piece of, of a paper. But I think people want to come and see the document that's here or come to the State Library and see our copy because it's a tangible link to the past. Um, ours is a, a document that John Hancock actually handled. I mean, this man that we know about through history actually signed this document. So it's a link back. And I think many of us, especially historians, like to have some real touch to, although we won't let you touch this document. Because <laughs> it's very important to preserve it. But you can at least look at it and realize this is a real piece of paper uh, that has survived the generations so that you today can actually see it. And there's lots of interesting things on it. The fact that Mary Catherine Goddard only used her first two initials, so it was not known necessarily that it was a woman printer. Um, she was unusual. She was also born in Connecticut, so we have a nice link to her there as well. Um, but many of us have now been charged with preserving these fine documents. And Ken, what sure. does that take? I mean, we heard about this document coming in today. It flew in first class in its mm -hmm. own seat mm -hmm. in a special case that preserves it with, I think, argon gas. I mean, it's extraordinary. What does it take to preserve them? Well, we don't go quite so far with the argon gas. I have a well, limited budget. I have a, budget bu I have a limited budget. <laughs> <laughs> but ours is behind a special glass today that cuts down UV lighting. Um, Fortunately, the paper that was used in those days was made out of old rags and it has much more stable than the paper uh, that we have today, which is much more acidic and will just destroy itself over time. So we uh, are fortunate that we have something that's easier to work with. And from time to time, they're given preservation treatments. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, uh, you know, we have it in a secured environment, and but we also want people to see it. Mm -hmm. And to think that for many, many years, it was folded away in a book of early documents in the in the vault so you know it's, it's important. Was it always known that it was folded away in the vault or did someone come across it? Well actually in the 1980s uh, our, we had a new state um, archivist join us, Mark Jones, and he was going through the files and happened to find a listing for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure, uh, we always say that they're rediscovered. Uh -huh. Somebody probably knew it was there <laughs> uh, but he found it, thought it was important that it be out on display, mm -hmm. it was carefully unfolded, it was given some treatment and then it's framed and put there. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very important to have these original documents. We should say that the document that you'll see upstairs, if you haven't been up there already, and there is a little video to go along with it, uh, that that document was thought to be lost. In fact, it was lost for a long time. And if you like to go to tag sales, there are treasures out there <laughs> because someone was at a sale. They bought a painting, uh, didn't like the painting, but liked the frame. 
and decided to take the painting out of the frame so they could use the frame for something else. And when they took the painting out between the paper and the frame and the painting was this folded up copy of the Declaration of Independence. And it later sold at Sotheby's for over $8 million. So um, if you're a tag sale person, keep looking. <laughs> Denise, you talked about um, the difficulty in getting people to vote. And I think if, if everyone had a chance to come and see this document and to be in its presence, I think people would be inspired. But of course, they don't have that opportunity. So how do we inspire people? Well, I think the words have inspired, you know, millions and millions of people around the world now of all moments how poignant it is to see the revolutions going on in all parts of the world inspired really by the words in this document. There was a, an interesting video clip of a woman in I think it was Libya who when some one of the reporters said why are you doing this? She said well we just want what you have and that's and that's exactly says it all and so we have it perhaps we take it for granted I don't know but I think um, it's obvious that words have a lot of meaning. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you said this was a political document, I mean, we're all, we could all recite that one probably most famous sentence in all of political history, uh, but the rest of it is a striking list of grievances. Mm -hmm. They were mad. <laughs> they were angry, and they had a lot of problems that they wanted to show the world why they were acting rationally, uh, but yet they were angry, and so, when you look at this as a political document, it probably would not have, have uh, withstood the test of time if it was just a list of grievances, mm -hmm. but it's that soaring language that encompasses all of humanity and, and tells us that we are all one people. We're all, we have rights, and they're associated with being human beings. And I think it was the, that is the genius of the document. So Ken or Walt, uh, do we know who's responsible for that soaring language in large part? Well, it's largely Thomas Jefferson, I think. But he, Thomas Jefferson is credited with authoring most of the document. Uh, those of you who have seen 1776 know that he had some editorial help from John Adams and Benjamin Franklin uh, and Roger Sherman, our own, our own founding father. But the, the language... The, all men are created equal comes out of a whole debate in the 18th century and the 17th century about what were the rights of individuals in a world that had largely been ruled king to subject for hundreds and thousands of years people were beginning to ask the question what are my rights as a human being and all men are created equal comes out of that rights language and still is the best single sentence, I think, of what our highest aspirations as a people are. I thought it was interesting, Ken, that um, Walt mentioned that there were still a lot of people who were not on board with this when the war started, and that in fact a lot of what led to the eventual uh, passage of the Declaration and to more people coming around really had to do with trade disagreements. This is true, and, and I was looking at the copy of the um, Hartford Current that came out um, shortly after uh, July 4th, or I think it was July 15th, and I was really interested that the declaration wasn't the front head. We're used to headlines today. You all know the headline from a couple days ago. Um, there was no headline, we declare freedom. Um, it was on the second page, and it's just a recital. It's a copy of the declaration. Uh, the front page had a more inspiring article, uh, but also had a list of people who they said, these are not good people. They're not supporting freedom. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get your name listed. Now, there were many people who were considered Tories, who still mm -hmm. supported the crown, and people were torn about where to go with this. Um, going up against um, the very large British Empire, or the beginnings of it at that time, I mean, this was not, you know, something you just did willy-nilly. So it was important. Also, back to the words, um, you have to remember that these were very well-read men. Um, they had libraries. They had read classical works. So their ideas were coming from some of the philosophy they had read as well and from debates that were going on. We think today that we're the only people that can communicate as quickly as we can. It's amazing.
amazing to think how quickly that document traveled around the colonies and people were having debates and it was recorded mm -hmm. and people knew through the newspapers what other people were thinking. So I think it's a you know, homogenizing of all the different conversations that were going on, but it took a great wordsmith to really to get it there. And Walt, I think um, we've been told that this document is really meant to be read aloud. Maybe that was because a lot of the colonists couldn't read on their own. It is. It, the Americans, and especially New Englanders, were highly literate. But a document like that was a focus of an entire community's attention. So w when you look at it, if you, if you haven't seen it yet, when you go up and look at it, think of the printer working the night of July 4th, turning these out as quickly as he could. Think of the way these, the very document you're looking at was packaged very carefully so that it could be handed to a rider who would ride as fast and as long as he could, in many cases at great risk, to take this message to communities where people could stand around and say, yes, we are free and independent. Think of what that meant. It's, you can read it to yourself and it means something. When you read it with your entire community there, realizing both what you've just claimed and the price you might have to pay for it, that document is as timeless as, as we think it is. Well, it was called a broadside. We still refer to it as a broadside because it was intended to be posted. Mm -hmm. um, very large and, you know, this was like to, to let the king know, we're letting the public see this. This wasn't a secret document that was, you know, sent around uh, quietly and, and shared with a few people. This was out there for everybody to see. It's like, you know, the circuses in town, you'll see circus posters. This was a big event and this was meant to be seen large enough to be read easily. And, and, and it's, it's part of the reason they have so many explanations of why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, the list of grievances is both very powerful and very long. And, and the idea is that when you get to the bottom of this, you almost, they would like you to feel compelled to agree that you didn't want to do this, you, you were pushed into it, you were forced to do it. Ken, I was struck uh, when I was with Walt actually over at the State Library and Museum that when you are in the room where all the portraits of the governors are, that the one portrait that starts off the whole line is not a governor. A king. He's the king. <laughs> we were a colony and our original rule came came through that. So uh, to represent our history correctly, you have to you know, acknowledge that um, the king uh, was there when we started. I, I often feel living in Connecticut that we're so privileged because we are uh, one of the founding colonies and I think an event like this helps us all hold on to that and feel close to it. And I hope that you'll continue to come and visit this building because that's where those signers were coming to get the government started. Um, we have about five more minutes. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask to any of our panelists? And my, yes, sir, over there. Uh, yes, in his book, Lincoln and Gettysburg, Eric Wills said that in a way, when Lincoln performed a great act of, thank you, a great act of open air sleight of hand and by transforming was basically a legalistic political document into a human rights charter. Uh, do you people agree with that view? I, I, I think that's one of the wonderful books, Gary Wells' book, uh, Lincoln, uh, on the Gettysburg Address. And he says that in that document, Lincoln fulfills the intention of the Declaration. That the idea of all men are created equal in 1776 didn't, it included, as you uh, indicated, it included white men with property. That essentially was the 1776 They're all equal. Meaning. Yeah. <laughs> In 1863, it became all men. And then another half century later, it became all men and women. And our, our national story is a story about, as, as Secretary of State Merrill said, continually redefining and enlarging the community of equality. That's a, that's, that's a pretty good national story. I like it. I think that's actually a great place to end. So if you don't mind, I think we're going to um, 
end on that note because I find that so inspiring as we're here in the presence of the Declaration. I want to thank you all for being with us, the Secretary of the State, Denise Merrill, our State Librarian, Kendall Wigan, who I know is going to ask you to all come by the State Library and see our very own copy, and our State Historian, Walt Woodward. Thank you for being with us. We thank the Norman Lear Foundation for making this possible, and we thank all of our readers today. If you have not taken the time to go upstairs and see the Declaration, please do that now. Thanks so much.